uh, just before we get into the lecture, I just want to make sure all of you got your group assignments for your presentations. Okay, so uh, I'd like you to start working on those, and those you're going to be presenting in your seminars. And you're going to get just a, a formative assessment on those. And uh, I'll be putting up, hopefully in the next week, your, uh, your essay assignment, which is going to essentially build on your presentation as it describes in your module spec. So uh, what you'll be doing is you'll essentially build on, on what you're going to do your presentation on in terms of looking at an industry <coughs> So your essay will be, you know, more industry specific in terms of thinking about an industry within either that region that you're doing your presentation on or a country in that region, okay? So you're going to have quite a bit of flexibility in terms of, of what you decide to do. It's really the most important thing to do um, is, so now as a group, you have a great opportunity to work with a number of people and really get to know the region really well, okay? And develop some uh, information above and beyond what you could do if you were just working by yourself. So really use the, the group presentation as a way of getting a broader understanding of the region and to learn from your colleagues. Then, from there, you can then think about how you want to structure your individual essay, okay? And build on that. So even though you might, for your group, part, work on a particular country or a particular aspect of the region, it might be that you find what someone else has done more interesting in terms of thinking about how you want to structure your essay, okay? So it's the whole idea is to really learn from this experience and build on this experience um, and to get some feedback. So I'm going to have two kinds of feedback forms. I'm going to have one feedback form for your <coughs> colleagues who are watching you present, okay? There'll be one for the instructor uh, as well. And then also I'll be looking for you to do some individual reflecting. Now you have to do the presentation part, even though you're not going to get a mark, you'll just get feedback. Um, but you have to have completed that and, and gotten, you know, that turned that in. And even though the, the feedback isn't going to go against your mark, uh, it will be necessary, though, to do your essay. So if you don't participate in the presentation, you then cannot do the essay, okay? So it's very, very important that you make sure you know what your group is, you work with your group, and, and you participate in, in that uh, experience. And again, it's just an opportunity to give you some feedback. Um, so the better job you do, the better idea you can get on how your thinking is, because really at this level, in a level three module, the most important thing that I'm looking for is really to see you develop your critical thinking skills and your analysis, okay? So rather than in a, a level one where I'm looking for people to learn jargon and, and, and regurgitate, you know, information, what I'm looking for here in this, this module is a little more sophistication and nuanced kind of perspective. So being able to think critically and to really analyze and how you approach things. And to be quite frank, that's the most important thing you're going to learn in your whole entire education. Okay? And so it's not just about this particular component or content to, to your, your program. It's those critical thinking skills because those will be the skills that you will take with you when you go out into the world to work. And there's really, at this stage and in, and in the world that you're going out to, to engage in, there really is not sufficient amount of content that you could be given, okay? You're gonna have to be lear learning and thinking and learning how to learn all the time. You will not just go to university and get a degree now. You will go back many, many times Maybe not to a formal sit down and do a degree, but you'll do executive education. You'll be learning on the job. So you need to learn how to be a lifetime learner, and you need to know how to gain those kind of critical thinking skills and how to look at things in um, a much more uh, analytical way, okay? 
so that, again, what I'm really looking for when you leave this course is to be able to think about countries, think about how they fit into that kind of global environment, um, and then think about companies and firms that operate in those countries and, and see the kind of opportunities and challenges, and also then know how to go about really uh, addressing you know, the, these various topics and how to look, look at things. So today, what we're going to do is I'm going to go back because I don't want to rush through this material, uh, particularly on, on the, the bottom billion. Uh, so we're going to go over the ca case study, okay, and, um, and then just have, have a few minutes to talk, and then we're going to get into talking about technology, which is a very interesting uh, subject in terms of how technology and growth fit together, and again, the relationship to incomes, because that's a very important part of what, what we're looking at in terms of thinking about the global uh, economy. And when we think about companies and where companies go, they need to be able also to identify opportunities, and those opportunities for growth will lie in countries that are growing, okay, that are emerging. So, so what are those factors? What makes an emerging market? What makes a country take off? How can I look at Africa and how can I identify which countries are going to be the growth markets? And those are going to be important things, particularly for someone going out engaging in business, being able to know and how to identify and, and look at countries. So one of the things that too, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at trade, we're going to be looking at finance, but, but all that kind of information of how to really look critically and think critically about uh, countries in terms of then thinking about them in, in a narrow sense in terms of business opportunities and, and uh, you know ways in which uh, firms can go ahead. So I started talking about Yemen and, and as I said I've got a lot of experience in Yemen having done uh, years of, of research and, uh, and as I said Yemen is, is really very much one of these countries that makes up this bottom billion and uh, is a, you know, a very poor country and although has had a little bit of a role in the Arab Spring, it, it, it really was very much a little role because um, Yemen really uh, epitomizes much of, of what you know, is embedded into the analysis and the, the thinking about why these countries at the bottom remain at the bottom, okay? And, you know, Yemen has, as you can see from these indicators, um, really, uh, and these, as I said to you last time, always when you're looking at uh, economic data, by the way, the one thing that, that you have to learn is to be really cynical, okay? Never take a number uh, for granted. Uh, a lot of people like to throw numbers around, and numbers, in many ways can be very powerful um, because once you put a number out there people lash on to it and people like something you know most of us um, and I, I know students in particular you know you always want things to be black and white and working in gray can be very difficult uh, you know students often hate when the the professor says you know things like I don't know or well it might look like this or it might look like that you know no one likes the gray. You want it's either this way or it's that way. But unfortunately, we we all know the world's not like that, is it? Mo most of what takes place is on a continuum, and most of it is right crunched right there in the middle, uh, and operates in the gray. And so there's very rarely that there's really a definitive answer to to much of what we actually teach. Uh, and you know, one of the things that that uh, how how many of you are are in economics or finance or, or more quantitative areas. Can you raise your hands? Let me just get a feel for it. Okay, don't, don't be shy, it's all right. Uh, I'm an economist myself. Um, so, okay, so some of you are. So, you know, the one thing, you know, that I, I always found over, over my, the course of my career is that whenever I get into a situation, I'd be speaking at an event or, or people would start you know, and, and I feel a little bit of heat, you know, like people are really kind of questioning my credibility, or I'd have some sort of, you know, political scientist standing over here, you know, who is, who is trying to, you know, pontificate about something he or she may or may not know very well. I could always deflect people by switching into numbers, okay? 
Because as soon as you, first of all, a lot of people have math phobia, and maybe even some people in here have math phobia. It, it's not that uncommon. And so when you start to use numbers, people just shut up, you know, <laughs> which is funny because in reality, you know, a lot of these numbers are, you know, economists love to use the word, we massaged the numbers, okay? Um, and, and we literally do. We, we often start out, you know, and economists, unlike, you know, like if you're in business management and you're doing a research project, for example, you will often approach it in a way where you'll say, okay, well, what, you know, let's look at these companies and we'll look for what? Best practice, right? Or we'll look to see how they do things. And we might do a comparative study of these companies or something like that. Uh, and we'll, you know, we'll have some parameters and, and we, we might have a, you know, a framework, but there's not a lot of theory per se in, 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 in management. It's, it's really you know, frameworks of analysis. Whereas in economics, we like to see ourselves as more of a science. So we often like to say that we have theories, you know. And so what we do is we, we say, here's the theory, okay. When prices go up, demand goes down. And we say that holds universally. And then we go out to start to take data and information and plug it into a, a regression analysis. We usually use a regression analysis because what we want to do is show a trend so that then we can use that to predict things. So if we're saying, you know, if prices go up, demand goes down, well then we want to collect a lot of data about prices and quantity of various goods and show that that actually holds. Then we can come back and sell our expertise of saying, okay, look, the price went up this much, that means demand is gonna go down this much, you know? And uh, so, so that, that's how we think. So we always start out with a theory, and then we have to prove that theory by collecting the data and the information and putting it either in you know, time series or cross-sectional uh, data forms. So what happens, though, is that a lot of times we run those analyses, and do you think we always get the results we're looking for? No. So then that's when we start the massaging, okay? So we change the numbers, we pull out a variable. Now, we rarely want to change our theory, okay? Because we, we have something we want to prove, right? And we feel very strongly about that. So that's why you have to realize that, um, you know, just like uh, people in politics have agendas, and everybody seems to accept that politicians have agendas, but economists have agendas as well, all right? And people who work with numbers have agendas. And we, just like the politician, but we're just, um, we like to think of ourselves as a little more of a hard science, we've got numbers behind it, and, and if we really wanna, you know, confuse people, then we start to throw out our numbers. So, that said then, when I look at numbers like this from a developing country, I always have a dilemma, okay? Do I show you the official numbers? And I can assure you that for every official number out there, there's an agenda. Uh, and I don't care if it's the United States of America or it's Yemen. There, there's some logic behind why did they collect that information? And you know, if you, uh, you know, are, are nerdy enough, like myself, and you go back and you look at statistical yearbooks, you know, uh, I was, uh, after I finished my PhD, I spent a year at Harvard as doing a research project on the uh, 1800s and looking at uh, uh, migration to the United States from Europe to the United States. And uh, I had to go back into the statistical yearbooks of the United States. Some of those were some when they first started collecting statistics in the US. So it was really amusing to see what things countries collect first. So, uh, like I said, nowadays it's quite sophisticated and data collection in the United States is quite sophisticated. If I look at Yemen, Yemen actually didn't start collecting any data at, at a national level till the 1970s. So you can imagine, they're <laughs> actually still relatively new at data collection. And it's a country that's very poor, so it's not like uh, if we do a survey in Yemen, you know, and you go, you know, you go here in the UK, right, and you want to go canvas an area, and you take, you know, Becton, and you can go, oh, right, we're going to pick and do a random sample, and we're going to go every other house. 
And is, it, is that possible? Well, yeah, it is because people have names and they have postcodes and they have addresses. And well, you know, lots of us who've only lived in the West, we can take that for granted. But if I go to Yemen, and I did, and I went to go do my field work, uh, do you think I found nice homes in a row with postcodes and addresses? No, of course not, okay? In fact, um, you know, most people, you know, had no addresses. A lot of the towns that I was doing research in had no street names, all right? And, uh, you know, so I couldn't do really a random sample. I had to do what was called kind of a population sample, where essentially everybody I interviewed became the population. And, and then I looked for, for certain profiles among them and then, and then build, build up my data set that way. So this is the problem. When you go out into developing countries in particular, you, even if you're trying to do legitimate statistical work and collect statistical data, it's, it's really challenging, okay? So you can imagine then if, if that's the micro level. Here I am, I'm the individual researcher and I'm going out into a particular part of a country and I'm gonna try to collect some data. Then if you take it then on the macro level and you think about national data, okay? How difficult is that then to really discern in countries where, as you can look up there, you've got a high illiteracy rate and even when we're talking about males being liter literate, that's a very low literacy rate, okay? Women, it is 70% illiteracy in, in, in Yemen. And uh, as I said, the, the, not the kind of organizational structure. And a country that didn't even start, you know, collecting data to the 1970s. And if you go back to the original statistical yearbooks for Yemen, which I have, uh, you will find things in like, uh, you know, how many, you know, automobile accidents, you know, uh, how, how, how many, you know, people, you know, got, uh, died of rabies and, and, and these sorts of things sitting right next to economic indicators in the same statistical yearbook, okay? So, you know, uh, just a hodgepodge of information because the society was evolving, people who were collecting the data weren't sure what they were collecting or why they were collecting it. And, and then, you know, later on, uh, you have things like they started collecting data and, uh, you know, working with the World Bank and different international organizations. And again, you see some, some interesting things. So, for example, uh, in 1987, the World Bank came in and they realized that, you know, the statistical authorities in Yemen were purposely keeping uh, GDP per capita, so the amount of gross domestic uh, product per person, below a certain level. Now, why were they doing that? Why were they actually purposely keeping their GDP down? Well, the reason they were doing that was because they wanted to qualify for uh, certain loans through the World Bank IMF, and they got a better loan deal if their GDP was kept down. So they were not using kind of internationally accepted ways of calculating GDP. So when the World Bank IMF finds this out, what do you think they did? Well, they said, yeah, go back and, and redo this. You know, you've got to stop doing it that way. So, you know, over many years of going to Yemen, I got to know the guys uh, that worked, and they were guys, in the statistical uh, organization in Yemen. And they said to me, they said, you know, uh, so this is what happened. So when you go now, and if you get a statistical yearbook, and, I, you know, it's interesting because I've seen other scholars, you know, there was a gentleman after me who, who wrote his PhD on Yemen uh, from an economic standpoint. He was at Harvard, and he uses, the, this official data. He didn't do a lot of field work like myself. And um, so what do you think he ends up doing? He ends up trying to explain 1987, okay? Well, there's really not much to explain in 1987. Well, you see, what happened was those guys in the statistical ministry, um, they were a bit lazy. So when they got caught, they started doing it the new way that the World Bank and the IMF told them they had to calculate it. But do you think they went back and reworked all those other years? No. And I'm not even sure that they could have gone back and reworked all those other years because they might not have even collected the right data. So, so it looks like something happened in 1987. Actually, nothing happened in, they, they didn't become wealthier in 1988. Actually, they just recalculated the, the statistics. But it's not, apparent if you just look at their statistical yearbooks. 
So again, you know, and I, I had um, at one time a professor who, who was at Princeton, and he told a story how uh, the OECD came in and they were looking for statistics on the Middle East and, you know, and he's sitting there and they said, well, what do you think the, the GDP of Syria is? And he gives a number. Well, what do you think, you know, of this? And he said later on, he, he uh, picks up an OECD document and here's all these numbers, all right? And then he had just really made up out of his mind. And then he said, years later, he had um, PhD student after PhD student using the OECD numbers on, uh, that, that he had just essentially made up in his office that day, okay? So, I don't want you to be totally cynical about numbers, but I do want you to question them. And, and you have to use your head, you know? It's, uh, again, uh, you know, once one of my students said to me, they went out to do some field work, and they were in this country, and they, they, they came and they said, oh, I'm, I'm really confused, you know, because the people told me they were growing wheat. But when I looked out into the field, you know, I, I saw them growing tomatoes. So what should I put down? Well, what should you put down? You know, obviously, either you're being lied to, okay, and there might be a reason why they're lied to. All right, there, there's often some very good reasons why they're, they're lying to you. You know, as I might mention to you, when I was doing my work in Yemen, you know, people would lie to me about certain things, but it was because they were very cynical of their government and they were worried. So if you ask them about how many male sons they had in the ages of their sons, they would often lie about that. Why? Why do you think they would be lying about their sons? because they didn't want them to be conscripts in the army. And they didn't want to draw attention to the ages of their sons, particularly if they were trying to avoid military service, okay? <coughs> you know, uh, w once I was in an area, they were so poor, okay? I mean, really adjunct poverty. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, the, um, the people were saying to me, so again, sometimes, you know, we, we have different techniques, like it, you'll meet somebody and you'll say, well, you know, how old are you? Oh, I don't, I don't know how old I am. And there might be no, no record. They were not born in a, a hospital, you know. Um, and uh, so, so then there's ways that you can date people, right? You can say, well, do you remember when, you know, King Fadl was around? And, uh, you know, and you, you pick historical moments. And then you can work back that way to figure out maybe how old this person is. Okay, so, you know, I, I go out and I think I'm such a clever researcher, you know, and I'm, I'm versed in all the techniques of, of working and collecting data in developing countries. And I go out and, of course, who am I working with? Well, I, I'm, I'm trying to speak to women, okay? So, um, so then I, I sit down with this woman and, and I'm going to show off. I actually have a colleague with me, so I'm going to really show how... how so I say to this woman, you know, in Arabic, you know, how old are you? And she says, you know, she doesn't know, you know. And uh, then there's some young people standing around. Oh, you know, she's 100. Oh, no, she's 90, you know. So I say, okay, I'm going to figure out how old she is, right? So I start out, and I start picking out these historical, you know, do you remember Imam Yahya, you know? And, uh, you know, and I, I start going through these historical points. And... Uh, what do you think I realized after about five minutes of talking with this woman? She had no idea what had been happening in her country, okay? But she could tell you, you know, you know when Samia up the street had a baby, <laughs> you know? And, you know, she could tell just very localized things. Of course, that was her world, right? You know? And so, uh, it, you know, again, it was that whole idea of, how do we then expect people coming from outside international organizations? So a lot of people I, I meet, and a lot of economists, they always think, oh, I, I looked, at, and I use the World Bank data, okay? Like somehow World Bank data is superior over everybody else's data. Well, I'll tell you something, and, and it's not, you know, if, if you can't find any other data source and you can't find a local data source, of course, sometimes you need just to get a number to get some comparatives, right? But the World Bank does not collect its own data. It gets it from the country, okay? So, so first of all, and then what does the World Bank do to make it all digestible for us and easy to understand? 
what currency do they put it in? Dollar. And that right there is problematic, okay? Because they're having to make uh, assumptions, and the assumption I mentioned to you is that purchasing power parity holds, okay? And so, uh, you know, right there, you know, you're starting down this, this idea. So, so the point I'm trying to make to you is if you think the number is off, it probably is. They're just numbers or estimates, guesstimates in many cases. And, the, and when we talk about the, the bottom billion and when you're doing your research for your presentation, keep that in mind. So that's why looking at data sources can only be one place that you look. You want to read the articles, you want to contextualize it. And that's why, uh, of course, I'm a political economist, and so that's my, my take on things, is that looking at economic variables in a vacuum and looking at them without contextualizing them is, is, is bad because you will not really understand. So. Saying that, then with these numbers, I can tell you right away are um, underestimations. And they're underestimations for a number of reasons. So unemployment or poverty will tend to be underestimated here because these are official numbers. Now, not too many countries want to say what? That we have huge unemployment, okay? And uh, again, you know, I remember when I was, you know, doing research and I was looking at people who were in Yemen and they were working in Saudi Arabia. And there were about two million Yemenis working in, in Saudi Arabia. So, uh, but, you know, the official numbers, so they went out and they did this survey and they came back with a number, it was like 1.4 million, which, which at that time could have been correct, the year that they were doing it. And uh, my friend who worked in the ministry said, oh, they took it to the minister because before they would publish any numbers, they'd have to have it approved, right? And the minister would look down and he'd go, that number's wrong. Increase it by this amount. This is after they've done the statistical analysis. This number's wrong. Change it to this amount, okay? So, so a lot of times he'd be, mas again, massaging the numbers because why? Some of those numbers were very loaded. They were loaded politically, okay? So again, you have to realize, unemployment numbers are always loaded. They're loaded in this country, okay? Um, and different groups, again, so you have to also look at who's producing the numbers. And, and you know, governments will try to, to paint things better in their way. Um, an opposition group's gonna do what? They're gonna uh, overestimate everything. They're gonna make the picture look worse. Okay, so you need to then, as the researcher, as the person who's 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 doing the analysis, what do you need to do? Get yeah, and get both. And actually, what you might want to do is take an average of the two. Okay, find some medium. Okay, in between what the the uh, official number is and then what the press or the opposition is saying it is. Weigh it up for yourself, okay? And again, is your number gonna be any ba bad or worse than <coughs> the numbers they're putting out there? No, okay? So again, so you can see that, though from looking at this that overall Yemen then is a very poor country, part of this bo bottom billion um, with uh, some actually some quite dismal uh, statistics. I mean, look at this infant mortality, um, you know, access to health services, uh, you know, m many things. Uh, actually, a population growth rate that's quite high. Um, and, and then look how many people in the population. Almost half the population is under 14. Just think how high the dependency ratio is. Uh, uh, average house size, 6.5. That means that you've probably got some that are much bigger. And one of the things that I found, because infant mortality is so high, it would be very confusing when I first started doing my survey and I would take, um, I was doing household survey, so we'd get background information. And what we'd find is when we'd go back in to look at the questionnaires, we'd find that the numbers didn't add up. And the reason is that um, some people, so you'd ask them how many children they had and she'd say 14. Okay, then you'd start into, you know, what, what, do, you, what do your children do, you know, what are their ages? and she'd only account for five or six children. Why was that? 
Well, the other ones had died as infants, okay? But she was still counting them as, as her children, okay? So, so then, you know, had to come back and, and change some of the questions so that we could be very clear then, you know, that we were talking about live you know, children. How many children do you have alive at this time, you know, so that the, the information matched up. So, in terms of, of the narrative and the story in Yemen, well, what makes Yemen a, a, an interesting case study is, is that we see a lot of these uh, issues then arising in terms of governance, in terms of relationships to resources, and, and, and this whole thing about the resource curse, as it were. Um, what makes Yemen exceptional, though, and, and, and kind of diverge from, from a lot of the other case studies, is the fact that um, Yemen had a lot of out labor migration in the 1970s and 80s, as I was just telling you. And that, that's really where my initial interest in Yemen came from as a trade economist, because part of trade is not just looking at the movements of goods and services between countries, but also factor mobility. So the movement of capital, which is often in the, in the form of money, um, and also in terms of, of labor, the, the movement of human beings. Um, and so my original research and my original interests were in labor mobility, labor migration, which is a very important topic in terms of, of how it changes economies. So I was very interested to see what were the structural changes that took place in the Yemeni economy from having all this labor because rather than exporting goods then in the 1970s and 80s, Yemen was literally exporting people. And we see other, other countries, the Philippines is very famous for female out migration. They export a lot of females. They actually encourage it and they go off, they often work as domestic workers, uh, nurses, you know, they work in the surface sector of other countries. And why is that so important to the Philippines? Because they leave their families behind and so they then send money back, remittances, okay? Um, and it's that money coming back in that, that then the Philippines earns by sending out, out this labor. So it was the same thing in the case of Yemen. Yemen had, in the 1970s of course, it was particularly after the oil crisis of 1973, you had places like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates and all of a sudden these countries, you know, became extremely wealthy. Now they had oil wealth, but they hadn't really exploited it, and, and much of the wealth had been previously going to uh, West. But in the 1970s with the oil crisis, most of these countries nationalized their oil industry. And with that then came, and the, and the rise in oil prices meant that a phenomenal amount of wealth uh, came to places like Saudi Arabia, um, you know, again, Oman, Ku Kuwait, uh, you know, the United Arab Emirates. So all of a sudden they became very wealthy. Um, and prior to that, and, and of course if you look at any pictures in these places, they were really, in, in some regards, Bedouin societies, not highly developed, and didn't really have much of an infrastructure. So the Yemenis, as unskilled labor, were then allowed to come in freely and, and really provide that unskilled labor. So, because Yemen was so poor and didn't have any uh, resources uh, that it was really harnessing, you had an out-migration of, of literally millions of Yemenis, but it was mainly a male mi a migration. You know, Yemeni men going, working in Saudi Arabia, working in Kuwait, and then sending money back. So all this money came in then in a very interesting way. It actually came down into the villages uh, throughout Yemen. So rather than going to the government directly, it came indirectly. So what's interesting about that then is that during that period, the, uh, the Yemeni government needed its citizens more. And this is what is really an important part of this story, is that they needed then. So, so you started to see the political system, which had been quite, quite authoritarian. They, they'd had a, a theocracy up to the 1962. And then they had a lot of civil wars, a lot of changes in leaders. And then, you know, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who, who was the former leader, was, um, came into power and was very authoritarian. But he still had to co-opt the people, he had to co-opt the tribes. Why? Because a lot of this remittance income was coming to the people. Um, however, if we fast forward then to the 1990s, we see then that with the 1990s, you get uh, what happened in 1990. You had the, um, the Gulf crisis, the first one. 
where uh, you know Iraq had invaded Kuwait, and you had the the Western powers coming in, you know, to push them out. And as I said to you, unfortunately for Yemen, it was on the Security Council that year. And uh, you know, there's one position on the Security Council in the UN that rotates around. And so uh, Yemenis. So you could think about it. They were going, and they were the poor labor in Saudi Arabia. And so you can imagine that uh, they probably had a very ambivalent feelings about Saudi Arabia and, and these wo wealthy oil countries, which they felt like were keeping them down, keeping them poor. They're, they're the poorest country in the Arab world and definitely the poorest country in, in, in the Gulf region. So they sided with Iraq. Um, which wasn't a very good idea. So, so again, they instantly then got their aid cut off. Saudi Arabia essentially kicked out all the workers, okay, and and they ended up back in Yemen. Now, Yemen really was not in a position to absorb all these people because, unfortunately, they needed those people to be working abroad to send the money home, and that was creating development in Yemen. And Yemen was developing, and and there was some very positive things with that. However, the saving grace was at about the same time, believe it or not, they found oil, okay, in, in enough quantity that they could start then exporting oil. So you have this real shift from really, from being very dependent on the external environment, and, a, and not, ne not necessarily a rent, but labor migration, and then overnight literally instantly that gets cut off I mean just think about the shocks on the economy you know that gets cut off and now all of a sudden you become an oil economy and uh, so now at the same time all this was happening however in 1994 because there had previously been two Yemen's one that had been more aligned with uh, the former Soviet Union one more more with the United States and the West so you had North Yemen that was aligned with the West and and South Yemen that was more with the, the former Soviet Union. So they had united in 1990, okay, just, just before the Gulf crisis. Um, but again, you can imagine with all the politics and everything and um, the strain on resources that getting the remittances cut off had created, um, that there was a, a and, and there was a lot of unequal development going on. So they, they they, of course, and what do we know about poor countries anyway? How often do they have a civil war? Yeah, about every five years, okay? So, they had a civil war, okay? And um, they started fighting about whether or not they should be one country, and the, the, the South wanted to break away again because they weren't happy with being together. So, um, they ended up in a civil war. Now, the, the Southern secessionists lost, so, uh, you know, it was a merger that had to stay. And, and the North then, then continued to, to uh, you know, have to take over the country. But it really put the country then in economic disaster. And so now you have the new, new player in town, and that's the World Bank IMF, who come in and they start to put in their structural adjustments because the country's running huge balanced payment deficits. Um, so Yemen is now looking more and more like the bottom billion. Okay, and and it continues to go that way. Uh, it then becomes really an oil-driven economy. So as we saw from some of the other uh, sources, that the economy becomes very fixated. But unfortunately, the problem with oil that we see in a number of oil countries, and we can look at Nigeria as another case, is getting that kind of trickle down. Okay, because oil wealth as a rent goes where? It goes into the government, okay? And then it's got to be dispersed. Whereas when, when Yemen was getting the labor migrant money, it was more distributed because it was coming to individuals. Um, and, and then, you know, with that came, came a lot of discontent. So, we see really two interrelated themes here. Um, the kind of role of factors of production in terms of shaping the relationship between the state and markets. And then also uh, this idea about development aid in these fragile states. Um, and the UN calls these bottom billion you know, uh, states you know, fragile. Um, and as I said to you, the kind of paradigm that's associated with those is that you know, these countries are really too 
too fragile to fail. And in the case of Yemen, one of the reasons, you know, when I, when I first went out to do research on Yemen, you know, my friends used to make fun of me, you know, and uh, we used to call me the original bean counter because there wasn't a lot of data, so I did have to go out there and I used to have to do surveys and I used to have to collect my own data. And, um, you know, because there wasn't a lot of interest in Yemen at that time. It was just a poor country at the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula. But, of course, as things changed, and, and as many of these fragile states have, have changed, and the paradigm changed after the Cold War, we started to see, you know, countries like Yemen, who now has a, a, a very large presence for Al-Qaeda, um, become much more of a threat, not just regionally, but internationally, and a lot more interest than in Yemen. So the interest in Yemen wasn't because it was poor, it's been poor f for a long time, okay? And not because it doesn't seem to be able to, to get itself going, but because all of a sudden the West felt threatened, okay, by, by, by the rise of Al-Qaeda. Um, so here's what you can see the revenue shift. You can see how important. Now, now again, you can see some ups and downs here, and that's of course why, because oil prices go go in cycles, okay? And sometimes, so sometimes it's boom and bust with oil prices. And then if we look here, and you see from this graph, so you can just see that remittances really flattened out, okay? Um, you know, starting in the early 90s and, and going forward. Whereas oil revenues, although they, they, they do a little bit of a roller coaster, they keep going up, okay? And so they took, became more and more important in terms of being the driver for the economy. <coughs> now, in terms of, of institutional structure, uh, as I mentioned to you, what you had in Yemen is uh, you had this guy over here, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh. He came to power in, uh, you know, uh, 1978, uh, and as I mentioned to you last time, that you know you can look back in the declassified documents of the State Department now, and you can see that they weren't expecting him to last more than a week. Okay, um, he did you know well for himself, uh, you know because uh, you know 34 years later, I mean well he lasts 33 years exactly, but you know he he stayed in there quite quite a while. All right, and. Um, and this is uh, President Hadi, who's the new president, who was actually the vice president of Ali Abdullah Saleh. So again, it's back to that whole idea that, that Collier breaks, points out in, in his work, you know, that um, not necessarily do, uh, do revolutions or change necessarily usher in change, okay? They're not necessarily the decisive driver. So you can change regimes and you can change the face of the leader, but that doesn't necessarily change the institutional structure. And that's something that we particularly see in the case of Yemen, where it has a very tribal-based institutional structure. And it, it, it dates way back, okay? And uh, those in power have tended to, to favor their clan or their tribe, um, and that, um, and people, you know, as I said to you, when, when there's elections in, in many parts of the world, and it's not just the Arab world, uh, we will often see that people do not necessarily, you know, this, this Western notion of I, I have a, a detached relationship from the candidate and I just vote for whoever. No, you tend to vote your interests and you see your interests in being either through your family lineage or your tribal lineage or your blood lineage or through your confession, your, your religion, you know, or, or it might even be uh, on your ethnicity. But, but if we look around the world, we see that that defines voting and voting decisions much stronger than representation, okay? Because representation doesn't take place in a lot of, of the world. So having a ballot box does not mean democracy, okay? <laughs> having a ballot box just means you had an election. So again, uh, you know, Yemen fits then very well into this kind of fragile state paradigm and the notion that then as a very fragile state, uh, people here are, are, are very unhappy. And, and, and again, you've got very, very low income levels, very, as I just pointed out to you, very high dependency ratios, lots of people under the age of 14 <coughs> being taken care of then by what? If over half of your population is under the age of 14, that means you have a very small part of your population who has to take care of a lot of people. 
So you might have one working adult taking care of seven or eight individuals. And that's a, a, that's a very big burden. And uh, as I said to you, Yemenis are uh, malnourished, uh, based on a calorie take, on, on all the human indexes, and consequently they're very small people uh, because their, their uh, height is dwarfed. So there, there are, are a lot of social issues, and when you have those social issues coupled with political uh, suppression, it shouldn't be surprising then that it's, it's ripe for civil war. And in fact, if Yemen doesn't get its act together really soon, and, and it, all indications it's not, um, there probably will be another civil war, okay? Uh, they've just come out of the Arab Spring, uh, but the Arab Spring really didn't bring about the kind of change that people were looking for. So you have now still people unhappy in the southern part, who still, the, the southern secessionists are, are still there. You've got uh, kind of straddling that a sphere in the south and, uh, is uh, Al-Qaeda, who in certain parts of Yemen is actually very, very prominent. Um, and then you've got uh, a northern group that um, is, is very much wanting to go back to the, the more theocratical times in, in which Yemen existed. <laughs> and so you have them up in the north. And then you have the central government then that's in, in, in Sana, and, and like I said, it's very much aligned to these kind of uh, tribal notions. So it's, it's really a very factionalized country. And although El Hadi has come to power and you know, said he's going to pull things together, he hasn't been very effective at it. And, and partly because what holds him in power right now is the United States. And they very much, of course, what is their interest in Yemen? Al Qaeda. Okay. So, so they're not necessarily looking to think about economic growth and development, but, but much more about the kind of political narrative. So again, we see then two kinds of narratives that come out. One is about you know, aid and, and the whole idea of aid being intended to support and build sound institutions. And you know, a, as we saw, in Collier, you know, the question of whether or not when you bring money and you put it into places that have bad governance, whether or not you just keep getting bad governance so it, it's wasted money, or whether or not you need to have influence and the only way you can have influence is by channeling money and directing it uh, into places to build those institutions. So those are the real competing thoughts and you know it's interesting because I, I've been on a, a number of panels. I, uh, when I lived in the United States, I used to go down to Washington, D.C. and speak sometimes. And I was very saddened over the last few years to really see a, a hardening, as it were, against A. But there's become almost what we call donor fatigue, where, you know, even among governments, where there's this kind of idea that for, for a long time, then, the, the prevalent idea was Aid is intended to support the building of sound institutions and facilitate development and economic development. But after pouring so much money into some of these countries and coming up empty-handed, you know, not seeing change, there's now come a, a much hardened kind of idea, saying you've got to have good institutions first, and if you've got good institutions, then you can think about you know, uh, putting you know, development aid money in there. And, you know, uh, as I said, a few years ago, I was in Washington, D.C., and I, I was giving a talk, uh, you know, there, and, and you know, I, I, I came up against some very, you know, pl some public uh, sector employees who were very cynical, and they said, you know, it's a waste, it's a waste to talk about, about putting money in there until the institutions are, are, are fixed. So, <coughs> why is that? Well. There, there's the notion that certain institutional structures, and particularly these kind of tribal structures, where you have uh, a very much a, a clientism sort of relationship, where you have the owners of resources, uh, you know, being very centralized, often the leaders, and they're distributing then the wealth. And you see this particularly in these countries where you have this kind of resource curse where you have things like uh, rentier states, where you have oil, and that oil money then comes in to you know, certain individuals. It doesn't trickle down. 
and they are essentially making the major economic decisions. Um, and, and the interesting thing is that we can see aid can act the same way, because how is aid channeled into a country? It's channeled in through the top, most likely, okay? And in fact, as I said to you, when we've tried to circumvent the system and, and channel it in below, it's been very poorly uh, administered, not have the effect. So we can't get around the state. And if we can't get around the state and the state isn't transparent and it isn't doing good government, and then we end up seeing in the resources very much wasted because uh, of this dilemma. And so corrupt, corruption is actually can be encouraged. You can actually end up with more corruption by channeling aid. So aid, in many ways, acts the same way as any other kind of resource. So you get the same thing that you would have if you had oil money or any kind of rentier money coming into the state. It then uh, doesn't get channeled right. And so uh, the other thing that we find that's even more worrisome is, like I said, what I saw in the case of Yemen is when the labor migrants were going out and they were getting money, the government felt like they had to listen to the people, okay? Because they had to get them involved. They had to try to get them to pay some taxes. They had to try to get them to invest their money. I mean, Yemenis went to great, the governments and the banks went to great lengths to try to woo migrants back. Not, not physically, but with their money. So they would try to get them, they'd have schemes and try to get them invest in Yemen. But when they started getting the oil money, did they need to worry about the migrant money? No. So it was amazing for me to actually witness this evolution, to see that up, you know, in the late 80s, when the government really needed money, they were really being much more inclusive. They started opening up the political system. You know, the first few times when I went to Yemen, people said to me, whatever you do, don't let somebody get you into a conversation about the president, okay? Because if you get into a conversation with the pr about the president, you know, it, c it could be very bad for you, all right? So I, I took that to mean, you know, that, that it was, uh, you know, not a good idea. And so, uh, and people were very careful and cautious what they'd say. And people would say, you know, there are uh, tens of thousands of people that belong to the secret police. Okay? This is, you know, just what people would say. But they would say, but everyone is a potential employee if they hear the right information. So be careful what you say because, you know, it, it could end up being, you know, trafficked uh, against you. <coughs> a few years later, as the government needed to really bring in, in, in the people, bring in their resources, and there was a lot more pressure from international organizations. Um, the co I was fascinated to see how people became much more freer about what they said, you know, there was a, lo a, a real opening up in, in terms of the dialogue. However, as the oil money and the country became more dependent on oil wealth, again, it was a reverse. You started to see a close, closing down then, and, and you saw the government not necessarily embracing what people wanted. So that, uh, you know, you had this, then this, this relationship because the government then became much more concerned about uh, aid organizations and making sure that, you know, the oil wealth kept flowing, but in addition to that, getting the aid money. And when the oil money would go down or oil prices would go down, the government would become even more desperate to attract you know, uh, aid money and relief money from aid organizations. So you get this idea that, um, you know, they would be looking and they would be promising the World Bank. So the World Bank would come in and they'd say, okay, well, you've got to do X and you've got to do Y and, you know, these are the conditions and if you don't do this, we're not going to give you the money. But the Yemenis were too clever and particularly, you know, Ali Abdallah Saleh, you know, he realized too that, you know, of course, they, uh, you know, this whole thing with Al-Qaeda, you know, that the Americans were very concerned, and so they wanted to work with him, you know, to help try to do this. And, you know, of course, I don't know that this is true, but, you know, people would say, the cynical side of people would say, well, you know, he knows exactly where Al-Qaeda is, and he could shut them down, but that might sh shut down the aid money that he's getting from the United States. So he's not going to close that door completely. So, you know, uh, 
So, but, but there did then get to be this relationship. So the, the government became much more fixated on tracking money from, from aid organizations or international organizations or governments and trying to you know, sustain their oil wealth than they did to listening to their people. Okay? And so you got this real kind of break between what the people were experiencing and what they wanted and then what was actually happening in, in the government. And, and it, as I mentioned to you before, I mean, one of, one of the problems is this question of also absorption capacity, you know. Um, and, and the whole idea that, you know, a lot of the aid that was promised was actually never received. And in fact, actually, if you look at the numbers, Yemen is actually very low in terms of what aid it received. And partly because it, it was not very transparent, it was not good governance. The aid organizations would say, you know, you have to do X and you have to do Y. And of course, they, they weren't able to deliver. And so they, there, there became this, this kind of relationship, you know. So that actually Yemen received very low levels of aid, even though the government was very fixated on always trying to get more aid money, okay. And, and as I said, when oil revenues were up, they didn't care. And when oil revenues were down, they tried to collect more aid money. So again, if we look at the numbers, and, and again, these are interesting numbers because you can see Yemen start to unravel uh, just uh, as, as we're leading up to, to this, this period. So again, you know, the, these are not the total numbers. These are official aid numbers. And, and what also, when I would go to Yemen, I would see that these aid organizations particularly get a lot of of little aid organizations, you know, non-governmental organizations. Everybody's got an agenda, okay? And you end up with a situation where you've got lots of different organizations. And, and one of the biggest problems with aid, and in a lot of these bottom billion countries, is it's not very coordinated. So you've got people all over the place, and, you know, they're setting up shop, and, you know, it, it reminds me of, uh, you know, the, the homeless guy, I remember once, you know, talking to a man who was homeless, and he was telling me his strategy for actually getting, getting more food, and, and he would say, you know, this religious organization comes, and if you stand there and you act like you're really interested, you know, uh, you, you, you get better handouts, and you know, if this one comes and you, you say, you know, this or that, you know, you'll get more, and um, well, and that's a little bit how the situation is in a lot of these countries with these international organizations. So you've got all these, you know, so, you know, today, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm green, and tomorrow I'm a Christian, and the next day I'm a Muslim, and, you know, because at the end of the day, I just need this aid money. Um, so it all gets a bit crazy, because all these, so you've got conflicting uh, agendas, um, and if there's not, one of the biggest problems in a lot of these poor countries is there's no organization. There's no really systemization where everybody says, okay, let's get all the donors. Yes, everybody wants to do good, as it were, but you know, it's like Collier said, it's this um, headless heart running around, okay? And, um, and it's not very effective. And it's subject to lots of abuse. Uh, and and the, the aid isn't getting channeled where it is. There's no really uh, official kind of construct in which it can form around. So, so again, this is one of the reasons why aid hasn't been very effective in many of these countries. Um, and then we can see a correlation between this, what I just showed you in terms of aid dropping down and corruption. Now, how do I explain this corruption? It's not that Yemen just all of a sudden got more corrupt, okay? Um, as, uh, you know, we, we went up towards, you know, uh, 2009. But, you know, I, I have many, many friends, as I said, and, and they would say to me, what happened there in the end, as they started to see things unravel, as they started to see and feel like there was, a, you know, a civil war on the, the horizon, you know, uh, whether or not it's grievances or greed, well, this was about greed. Uh, many people said, well, look, grab it while it's still there, you know, and grab it, you know, so, so people started really looking, and even a lot of government officials and people started to really um, take on more and more kind of corrupt practices, as it were, as the, as the country started to unravel. 
Um, and this is really, you know, very much the lead up to the Arab Spring or, or uprising in Yemen is, is this, this kind of unraveling then of the economy. So again, you can see why a lot of the aid donors then were holding back, not distributing the aid because of the level of corruption that was taking place. Um, so what do we learn from all this? Okay, um, kind of pulling it all together. Uh, I think what's particular, again, about the case of Yemen is that, uh, you know, they went through a period in the 70s and 80s, and, and you know, it was amazing for me to just watch because, as I said uh, last time, when I started going there, I thought it was a poor country, but I never imagined in my wildest imagination, uh, uh, call me a naive person, but I thought they would get wealthier over time. But like so many in this bottom billion, they got poorer over time. And, and it was very sad and disheartening for me to watch because I have so many and many friends, people who have been very good to me over the years. So, and, and to watch them go from that period where they had the labor migration and, and, and it was distributing wealth to a, a period where they became then much more dependent on uh, oil, oil revenues, and became much more like a frontier state. And that dependency then really created a, a, a major kind of structural change in terms of, of you know, the role that the government played in the citizens. Um, so that you had this kind of corruption and mismanagement that really prevailed. Um, and so in many cases, uh, now what you see is, because Yemen is running out of oil, it has very limited oil resources, so it, it's almost like a missed opportunity. They had that opportunity, they had the wealth, and um, it was not used right, it was not channeled correctly. So now, you know, aid has substituted for oil. They're very much an aid-dependent country and very much looking for aid. But unless that aid is used effectively, unless they can develop the right kind of governance and institutions, um, the aid will just end up doing the same thing that the oil did. It'll just be a different kind of rent, but it will lead to the same corruption and the same problems in terms of their absorption capacity. <coughs> so that uh, what, what we see then is that institutional structures really matter, and they matter a lot. And part of the reason that many of these countries in this bottom billion, you know, one of the, I would say, the, the most important reason that so many of them uh, cannot, you know, really break out of this poverty trap is because they do not have the uh, appropriate institutional structures, okay? And, um, and these structures that they do have tends to uh, create corruption and inter inappropriate use of uh, aid and, and its allocation. And again, you know, the frontier state is one of them. You've got clientism, neo-patrimonial states, and, and these states that we see in places like Sub-Saharan -Sahar Africa, uh, you know, somewhat in the Middle East, um, oil, you know, rich countries, that we see that these kinds of institutional structures then really do not lead themselves um, to sound institutions. So really, just lastly then, kind of pulling all that together before we get into talking more about technology and, and its role, Okay, um, we see then that these individuals, we can't just leave them behind. We can't just pretend that this bottom billion doesn't exist. And particularly in this day and age, as I said, where we have uh, come to realize that these fragile states, whether they're Afghanistan, whether or not they're Yemen, whether or not they're Somalia, you know, uh, they matter. Okay, they matter both politically, geopolitically, and they both and they matter economically. You know, if, if companies and firms and and um, and the world, if, if it's really about bringing people out of poverty and bringing up the world, then then we then this this one fifth at the bottom really does matter, and they matter significantly. Um, and also because it does have it has a tremendous amount of spillover effects to other countries and other parts of the world. So, you know, some of the things then that needs to take place, uh, and these are really recommendations that come out of Collier as well, is there needs to be increased monitoring and supervision, okay? They, they and, and that, you know, just regime change 
And, and again, if we look at the Middle East and we see the aftermath of the Arab Spring, it's, it's very interesting to see uh, how that's playing itself out. And, you know, uh, of course, there was all the excitement about, you know, the fact that there were these uprisings, uh, in, particularly in a region where you had had authoritarian regimes that had stayed in power for a very long time, um, where, uh, you know, what was interesting about some of those is you definitely had a relationship, sometimes a principal re uh, agent relationship between the governments and, and, you know, organizations like the IMF and World Bank, which on the one hand were hailing places as Egypt as great successes, um, and on the other hand, the, 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 the over poor half of the country was getting poorer. So there was definitely something wrong with that narrative. And, but on the other hand, uh, you know, change and revolutions of, as we're seeing are very messy, okay? And they take time and um, getting the kinds of institutions in place. And, and I think one of the, the biggest criticisms I think I have of myself and of the West is we bore very easily, okay? We get very excited when there's a lot of action and, and because we do now in the world you live in, you, you're, you're constantly being inundated with information from all over the world. The news organizations, they do what? They chase the latest story. <coughs> and it's very easy for us to forget very quickly. How many of you know what's going on in Libya, for example, right now? Okay? Um, maybe one, two of you. Okay, not very many of you, all right? So again, and, and Libya is, is, is definitely having a very rocky ride, and, and there's not really a, a clear path forward. So this is really, you know, again, how we engage with these countries, and we, and we have to engage in, in a real way. And, and so we need to have much more monitoring, much more uh, uh, commitment to assisting these countries in change. Uh, so it's not just about giving money, as I said, aid, if not aid, is, if it's not channeled correctly, if loans, and loans are actually more dangerous than aid as we can see in the case of Africa, because if you give lots of loans to a place, and then those loans are not, that money is not used to create sustainable development, what have you done? You've just created debt, okay? And more debt, and more debt, and more debt. And now you've just washed this country in debt. And even if they get regime change, that new regime will inherit that debt. So again, money doesn't necessarily uh, solve the problem. And sometimes it can actually make the problem worse. So, so we, ha we have to be a, a bit cautious then about how we give money or, or loan money in particular. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that Collier talks about and calls for is international charters to improve governance. That there needs to be really a definition, as it were, by the international community of what constitutes good governance. Um, and, and again, it's not about what we've found, what uh, the last few decades have really demonstrated to us, is it's not about laws in the books, okay? You can put all the laws you want on the books. I, I can assure you, Yemen has all the right laws in the books. If you pull the books out, they look like they've got very sound legal systems, institutions. That does not, laws on a book in and of themselves do not create rule of law, okay? To have a rule of law, you have to have a judicial system that's respected, that has the authority and the ability to actually you know, mandate the kinds of decisions that they need to put through. People have to trust that system. It has to be transparent. Transparency and accountability are probably two of the most important aspects of good governance. Um, so there needs to be some sort of universal principles in which we can, as a, a, a global community, can agree upon in terms of thinking about this. The other thing is, trade has to be addressed at a global level. I mean, one of the problems that many of these countries face, um, and, you know, when I teach trade theory, and I, and I talk about trade theory, and when, if you've learned any trade theory, maybe you've learned about Adam Smith's absolute advantage, or David Ricardo's comparative advantage, those trade theories are very Eurocentric, okay? By their very nature, they're very Eurocentric. They were really developed in the West by British political philosophers who were looking to do what? They were looking to
convince ne a mercantilist who thought that you know a trade should be a zero-sum game where you exported your goods and you got precious metals back that trade in resources back and forth was very good very good for who for Britain okay so as much as we want to talk about those being free trade theories those theories were very much about uh, you know helping Britain extend it and grow its income given its limited resources as an island okay so one of the things then that we see as in many things uh, that the the powerful dominate who 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 leads at the the uh, World Bank I told you this last time in the IMF who's the most important country yes. the United States and if you think about the World Trade Organization again who leads, who's really making those trade policies? The United States, to a great extent. I mean, think about it. When the, U, when the World Trade Organization meets and they have a summit, and let's just say that, you know, putting all the, you know, trade critics aside for a minute and just saying, let's just look at card, hard cold facts. Okay, you got Ghana coming to the table. You got the United States coming to the table. Now, think about resources. And we're going to be lobbying and negotiating and setting trade policy. That's what we do, okay, when we get together. Now, you take a poor country in Africa. How many people do you think they send to a typical trade summit? One, two, maybe if they're lucky, ten. How many people do you think the United States sends to a trade summit? 150, 200. Okay. Now, just imagine all the little subcommittees and all the experts and all the research that's gone on ahead of time. Okay? So you've got really this very polished team that knows what they want, who they want it for, and they're not going there and saying, you know, no, we're here for the United States, but we're really here for God. No, they're not doing that. Okay? They're there to negotiate trade policies that will help and facilitate trade for the United States. That's what they're paid to do, and that's why they're there. Ghana is sending their guy, okay? And he can only split himself one way. So by the very nature, even if you were to say that the votes is the same, and they all can be at the same committees, and they can all, they're just not represented the same, the way they're able to lobby, the way they're able to be, be presented there. So, so it, it shouldn't then surprise you, it shouldn't be a revelation if I say to you that yes, many of the policies that come out of the WTO are not necessarily the fairest policies. Um, now, having said that, I'm not a big fan of fair trade products because I'm not convinced they're free, free, fair trade, okay? Because again, a lot of it has become very commercial. It, it's, you know, um, a lot of companies have found out that young men and women like to feel like they're part of the world and they're they're part of the trade. And you know, you have to be always very cynical, by the way, about these companies who say, you know, buy my you know product I give to breast cancer, you know, and then you find out that it's probably half of a percent uh, of a percent. Okay, so you know, the the point is though that fair trade that kind of fair trade and and you know I've had some students be very shocked when I say I'm not not a big fan of fair trade products because the reason is I, I like to see that money put in to making a more level playing field up here where policies at their very nature are made fair and that we get proper representation and that these issues are dealt with rather than trying to me what you're trying to do is put a, a band-aid on a gouge you know you got something that's pouring out blood and you bring in a little strip and you're putting it here and you're putting another strip here well it's pouring out in between those two strips um, in the meantime so that's why you know um, I, and I'm not dissing fair trade products I think that originally when they started there there were some very good intentions there okay I do think though that there's some very cynical companies that have turned fair trade into just another brand. And I'm not sure how much of it, if we go back and do the research on some of these companies, is actually creating a better level playing field in terms of fair trade. Where we need the fair trade 
is the ability to lobby, the ability to be representative, and to have a, a very informed kind of conversation about how to create more trade that is fair um, by getting better standardization. You know, one of the ways that trade is not fair today is not through uh, quotas or tariffs, you know, taxations and limits on what can be brought in, but it's done through standards. It's done in a much more kind of covert way. It's by saying, you know, I mean, have you never asked yourself why you can't have a video, you know, a DVD in the U.S. and a DVD here, you know, and, and then you have to get a, something that could use both of them, or why, why TVs, you know, can't be brought from one place to the other because this, the screens are done differently in terms of, of how things go. Uh, things like um, clothing, clothing items that have certain restrictions on them. So again, it, it's getting, getting those sorts of things more evened out so goods can move more freely, easier, with less costs associated. You know, um, if, I, if I want to bring an automobile from the United States or I bring an automobile here from, from Europe back to the United States, it's got to have, you know, the Department of Transportation inspection stickers on it there in the United States. And some of the regulations are just different from Europe. Why is that? To, to discourage people from doing that you know, so that they're brought through in different ways. So it's those sorts of things that need to be done and addressed in terms of making trade fair. And also allowing then some of these countries that might actually make things cheaper and, and more efficiently and, and, and utilize uh, world resources, instead of just thinking always about country resources, world resources more effectively, allowed to give into the markets because one of the more complicating things for these bottom billion is they're going out into a world that is not very friendly towards them exporting and trying to build their economies and so they're really now you know uh, the Asian countries were were much more fortunate some of the ones that got in early um, and, and, and took, you know, the West, as it were, blindsided. But for these countries now, this bottom billion, they go into a market that's very aggressive, very hard to penetrate, and very hard to really move forward in. So again, we need much more of a levy playing field in terms of trade. And, and then, as I, I, I was saying a minute ago, this kind of international coordination of aid, um, it's got to be coherent, you know. Uh, this, this, you know, various agendas and, and, and different governments, and government to government aid and, and, you know, international organizations and then you got the loans and then you got the, all the small NGOs. I mean, I used to make a joke when I'd go to Yemen and I'd say, you know, for God's sakes, can't Yemeni women be allowed to do anything but be in sewing circles, okay? Because all these little NGOs, these non-government organizations would come in and what would they create? Sewing projects, you know, for, for Yemeni women. Uh, these women that are 70% illiterate, who really needed to be reading, writing, learning about all sorts of health issues, maybe giving micro loans so they could start, you know, their own businesses and stuff. Most of the, the organizations, they were not very uh, innovative. And so they would be copying off one model. And often that was, like I said, they'd start these sewing circles where women would do piecemeal sewing, where they were getting like one cents an item, you know, and sometimes not even that amount, um, and, and it wasn't really making a difference. So there needs to be a much more coherent strategy and a pooling of the resources as well. Okay. All right. So, so before I go on here, um, so, any questions, comments? I think the gentleman in the back had a comment. Yeah, um, why do the um, aid organizations continue to give aid to the government? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, what's your name? Samson. Samson. Yeah, that's, that's really actually a, a, a really good question, and I'm glad you asked it because I, I, I should have mentioned that. So, yeah, that, that's a great question because there is something in for that. And, and, and it's one of the things that you see with the World Bank and the IMF. As I, I said to you, you know, th those are a great example of organizations that really, if you think about what their original mandate is, they shouldn't even exist today. Because they were created under a fixed exchange system 
that stopped existing in 1971, okay, when, the, when Nixon, uh, Richard Nixon in the United States closed the gold window. And yet, they have managed to create a life of their own. So what is it in for these organizations is, this is what I call the aid industrial complex. It is that these are job creating for these individuals. So these aid organizations actually have an incentive of, you know, um, you know and again, I don't want to sound overly cynical, but, uh, you know, we, we talk about, you know, how, and, and we, you know, there are people who sell arms, right? Arm dealers, and arm dealers benefit from what? Conflict. You've got aid organizations and aid employees, and they benefit from what? Poverty, okay? So that's very cynical, and I realize it's very cynical, and I'm not trying to say that everyone who works for an aid organization thinks that way, because I don't believe that's true, but there is something to be said for that. <coughs> so that if you were to say, don't give any aid, they would lose their job, okay? And, and the other thing is, if you work in these aid organizations, you have a lot of pressure on yourself to show what? Success. Because you are getting your money from donors. A lot of times, these private NGOs are sponsored by private donors. And what do those donors want to see? Results, okay? So, again, when I was in Yemen, and I went out and I lived in this village and it was in nowhere. I mean, when I say nowhere, I used to take a bus from the capital, Sana, to Taiz, which is a secondary city. It used to take me about five hours. Then I'd get in this group taxi, you know, with about, you know, eight other people for a car that should fit four, and we'd go another two hours. Then I'd have to go on foot for another, you know, four or five miles walking to get to the village I was uh, doing my research in. And when I'd get back out there, now, again, you know, you're out there in this area, it was a very, very poor area, and, you know, they, they come out of nowhere, this, I can't even remember what organization was, and they build a hospital, okay? Now, it wasn't a very grand hospital, and they put in these x-ray machines. Um, of course, what didn't they give us? A technician to know how to use them, okay? So, of course, by the time we all got, you know, the tour and finished looking at them, and uh, they took, you know, the photos, they built the hospital, you know, the government came out, they cut the ribbon, and um, they left. <laughs> well, there was only one doctor out there who really wasn't a doctor, and as I said, you know, people were bringing me x-rays all night long thinking I was a doctor, and I had to constantly explain I wasn't, and then, then that started gossip about the fact that I was a fraud, I wasn't really a doctor, you know, because they couldn't understand that there are any other kinds of doctors than medical doctors. So, but this is an example of, of what goes on. Um, the other thing is, I'd look out, and I, when I was riding in that taxi for those two hours out to my village, I would see water pumps everywhere, okay? And it, it's really disturbing because Yemen has, right now, it is about to run out of water. And that area I was in, around Taiz, is already out of water. Why? Because they have literally, the Japanese, the Americans, you know, European aid organizations have passed out water pumps you know, like they were passing out candy. And these people have drilled down now and used up almost all of the groundwater. There's nothing left, okay? And you say, well, why would they, they do that? Well, because that gave somebody a job. You know, there's a great book. It's called, if you have a chance and you can find it, it's out of print now, but you might be able to find it online. It's called The Despairing Developer, okay? And it's written by a guy uh, who went out to Yemen and uh, I worked for an aid organization. And it's just, it's about his experience, and, and it, it's, it's not a very good indictment on aid. But again, and I'm not saying that all aid projects are bad, and I'm not saying that in places that have good governance and have good institutions, aid can actually really make a difference. But in many of these places in the bottom billion where they don't have good governance and they don't have transparency and they don't have accountability, the aid comes in and is misused, and a lot of times the aid organization is not a naive, you know, soul in this, this process. But these people who often work in these organizations, they're trying to hold on to their jobs as well, okay? And they're trying to make sure their donors who gave them money are feeling happy, 
you know, and, you know, feeling like something's happening there. And so it's just, it's this vicious circle. There's no project, they don't get paid. Exactly. If you don't have a project, you don't get paid. Again, you can go on, I think it's uh, called Development Jobs. Uh, I'll get you the exact site. Go on there and you will see it lists all these <coughs> jobs in all these developing countries. And they're looking for some of everybody and everything. And it's, it's, it's oh, you got hundreds of jobs and hundreds of projects. And yes, there are many, there are tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people who are making their job, they're living off this A industrial complex. So that's what's in it for them, is it's their livelihood. And, and again, it doesn't mean that a lot of these people don't have really good intentions, okay? And that, that's where the, you know, the image of the headless heart it's just that you get caught up in this kind of game sometimes and and you know there's a certain amount of rationalization that goes on at place you know I, I once said to somebody you know I wouldn't work for the World Bank and uh, you know I, I had friends that would go out and they do projects for the World Bank and and uh, and then they would try to say to me well you know don't take the moral high ground Nora you know uh, you know somebody's got to do the work they're going to do the project whether or not it's me or it's you, okay? So, so again, you know, there's a bit of rationalization that sometimes goes on, but, but uh, it, it, it's tough because on the other hand, you have these governments that are often saying, you know, we need aid, we need money, we need support. And the question is, back to, to those two schools of thought, do we just give resources to countries that have good governance? And um, can we give resources to create good governance? And, and I really, you know, I'm, I'm going to be the bad professor and say I don't have a definitive answer for you. But I do think that this has to be an issue and, and a dialogue that goes beyond uh, individual institutions. But it needs to be really an international an mandate. And I think we have seen much more of that kind of dialogue taking place recently. We've seen, you know, again, if I use Yemen as an example, We've had now uh, two different occasions here in London where they have convened all the donors um, and, and tried to actually come up with some, some sort of co coherent plan. I think also we're getting a lot of donor fatigue out there. We're getting uh, donors who uh, maybe are not the actual practitioners, but are the people that are lying behind those with the money. And money, of course, as we know right now, is really tight. It's not just tight here in Britain, it's tight globally. And there's a lot less money for aid right now. You know, I had a lot of friends who work in, in the aid industry, and uh, they, they were very upset, actually, when uh, the Iraq war took place. Because Iraq, as much as they said, OK, you know, Saddam Hussein needed to go, but they were saying, you know, Iraq had been a middle-income country. And a lot of the aid that was uh, supposed to go to Africa was then moved over to Iraq. And so they were very concerned about what the impact on Africa would be, okay? So, so it, it, it all interrelates. Um, the other problem with aid, just as an aside, uh, particularly, for example, U.S. aid, is that um, a much of it over a certain amount has to go to what we call government procurement. So which, which means that aid from the United States has to be used by, it either has to be an American company that ex executes the service, it has to be American products, okay? So, uh, you know, the, we used to make a joke that in the case of the United States, it's better to give than to receive. Because by giving, they're, they're uh, putting a lot of American companies to work. Because, um, and the reason why when I was in Yemen, and I look, used to look out and I'd see all those water pumps laying broken on the, uh, on the, the ground, was because the Yemenis would get given these water pumps from places like the United States, and they'd be U.S. water pumps. Now, as soon as that water pump broke, could they afford to phone up the U.S. and get the part, the missing part? No. So they just pull it up and throw it aside and wait for the next aid organization to come along and give them a new one. Okay. So again, uh, and and and. It, and you know, I don't want to sound too cynical because I really care about, you know, a lot of these countries and I want to see them progress. Um, but I think it's got to be in a much more coherent way. Um, and, and we need to recognize that what we've been doing just isn't working. And, and it hasn't worked for the vast majority of these countries.
Huh? Yeah, yeah. He's saying he thinks there's an eternal trap. I think I think there is. I think it's kind of a vicious circle. Um, and 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 you know, it, it's just you know. And again, and that's what Collier is trying to do. He's trying to really highlight this isn't working. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other comments or questions? Then why do you not allow countries to borrow the money to invest in the areas where this may be considered uh, uh, um, make a difference? Make a difference and, and get some money to back into the infrastructure of the country. Yeah, so he's asking why why aren't countries just given the money and allowed to invest it in what they think that they like to invest in? Okay, so, but I'm going to tell you something interesting as an economist. If you, you know, there have been many studies done in welfare economics, and actually, um, what you're saying is correct. We don't, we don't trust them to do what we think is in their best interest, so we normally want to tell them what to do, um, and they don't often want to listen, so it's not that they don't often do what they want to do, but Actually, having said that, if I look at studies that have been done at the micro level within countries, so in the United States, for example, if you don't have, and I'm not sure how they do it here in Britain, so, uh, but in the United States, if you're very poor and you qualify for food aid, okay, we don't give you money. We'll give you, when I was a child, we used to give you what we call food stamps. They were like, you know, special play money that you could go to the grocery store and you could buy food with. And now in a, a more sophisticated world, we give people a, a, a kind of like a credit card that they can use in the grocery store to buy food if they're, they're poor. However, studies show by economists that actually this gentleman's right, that if we would just give those people money, okay, because of course, what happens with uh, those food stamps and those credit cards? They're sold on a parallel market, you know, a black market, okay? So, so people in the end get what they want, but they lose some money in the process because they don't get the full value of the, the food stamps or the food credit card that they would have. So that actually, in reality, studies have shown that if we would just trust them and give them the cash, actually, we would probably get better value overall. Of course, there's going to be some people who are going to use it poorly, okay? But um, there's also going to be some people who are going to use it better. So, so now I, ha I don't know whether or not that's true on a country level. I haven't seen those studies. But I do know that's uh, true on a, on a micro level. Okay, one more question uh, before we move on. Anyone? Concerning NGOs, isn't the system a bit changing now? Uh, and the terms orient towards teaching, or to farm, to bring crops in, to get basic health. Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, the NGO industry is so mammoth, and, and it really is an industry, okay? It, it, it's a sector within itself. So, uh, you're right, there are actually some NGOs that have done a rethink and said, we'd rather give skills, and there, there's actually always been some NGOs that have been much more skill-focused, um, and, you know, um, actually I think Oxfam is a very good NGO that has always been much more about creating uh, skills and getting people to be more uh, independent. And I think there is a realization in the aid community across the board that um, giving people money creates dependency. And dependency, um, you know, if I started saying to you, if you come to class, I'm going to give you 10, 10 pounds. Okay, and every time you come to class, I just give you 10 pounds, you know, but I don't expect you to actually do anything, and if you, if you uh, walk out after you've come, you know, it's okay. Um, you know, and after a while, I'll assure you, you're going to get unhappy with the 10 pounds and think that it should have been 15, all right? So, but if I come in here and what? I give you, you know, some knowledge and I give you some skills, and then you can go out and get yourself a job that, you know, uh, you're going to feel much more happy. You know, you're going to feel happier with the experience, and, and it's going to be more positive. And yeah, I think there is that, that shift now in the, in the aid community, that what we don't want to do is dependency. The other problem with aid, to be quite frank with you, is that a, a lot of aid has really been politics, okay? 
And, you know, it, it's not by accident that it was in the uh, post-World War II period that aid and aid came to the forefront. So there's also, it's a bit messy and not, and in, even in some NGOs, that, you know, there's some very good NGOs and then there's some NGOs that very much have agendas. Um, and, you know, we've seen, uh, particularly, we've seen uh, religious organizations that, you know, have a uh, very specific kind of uh, agendas. We've got um, organizations that, you know, are very much uh, focused on government mandates, you know. And the United States has been criticized for doing things like um, giving groceries to collect information, okay? So, you know, and, and, and I don't say that with any pride, by the way. But, uh, you know, there, there's been cases where, you know, we've gone out and, you know, handed out food and collected information simultaneously, you know, because we want to know information about, about them. And, and if you look at, you know, it, it's, you know, most governmental uh, aid is given for political reasons as much as uh, social reasons. Because if it was all about social reasons, then we should see all the aid channeled to the poorest countries, and we don't. Okay, we see the aid going to a lot of countries that are more medium income countries. So, so, so there's there's a lot of different agendas, but there are definitely organizations that are are, are legit and, and trying to to create um, skills. But again, you know, my only hesitation about even those organizations is that um, are they skewing the economy towards something that they have actual comparative advantage in, or are they just you know you know, so so if if it's got it's got to be part of a larger development picture, and I think that's a, yeah, and that's the problem. Like those organizations I'm talking about are from Kenya, I think, and the thing is, they're too small to make a difference. Because in the scale of one village, it's great for the village, but what about all other villages? Yeah. And how does it fit into the bigger picture? You know, I had a student actually a few years ago who did a, a really interesting project on Grameen banks. You know, this whole idea of microfinancing. I think you was in the video you watched. And uh, you know, what she found was, uh, you know, yes, it helps there, but uh, unfortunately, it doesn't often f filter out into the bigger macro economy of the cult country. So you know, how do we? So you end up with these people get these little enterprises going, but how do you turn those small enterprises into medium enterprises to in, at large enterprises? And and there we haven't done enough research, and there there so so there was a complete disconnect. The other problem with microfinancing is that because the transaction costs are very high, sometimes the interest rate that they're they're being charged, even though it's being sold as as aid, and maybe you could say these people wouldn't have gotten a loan otherwise the interest rate is so high on those microfinancing projects that they're, they're really could be considered exploitive, you know. Um, and so, again, calls a lot of things in question. So again, it's that ability and that necessity, as, as Collier says, so we've got to, we need to think about this as a rural community. We need to think about it in terms uh, of, of kind of more bigger picture sorts of elements. Okay, so let's, uh, continuing with that, let me see how I'm doing on time, I'm a little chatty, so I think I'm almost out of time. Um, so let me just start introducing, though, this topic of investment and technology, because it feeds really on this uh, whole idea, and, and of course, um, you know, we often talk about the poverty trap, uh, or countries, you know, how do countries grow, okay, so we say, you know, I've been, I, I've been harping to you the last couple of weeks what growth is good and we need growth to have incomes because growth leads to higher incomes and higher incomes lead to what? Better societies, okay? And um, across the board, countries with higher incomes are better places to live, have higher standards of living, and, and are more productive. So, but how do we get there, okay? And that's, that's the, real, the real question. And, and you know, as I said to you on, in the first lecture, you know, we've gone through uh, lots of different narratives of how we think about growth and its relationship to investment, technology, and, and, and to income generation. So, really now, just focusing on some of those narratives, if we think about then, uh, and think about investment and growth, 
there's definitely a, a, a direct link between investment and growth, okay? Um, and the whole idea then that you get uh, an increase in your income uh, from that investment component. So we think about uh, a standard, you know, uh, gross domestic, you know, uh, in income, okay? And income equals what? It equals consumption. It equals investment. Uh, you know, so you have consumption spending, investment spending, government spending, and then you have what? Your uh, exports minus your imports. So, so that's that's what that equation is. So it's uh, income, GDE, which equals C, which is consumption, everything that's consumed in a society, uh, plus everything because, e again, this is based off the notion what? That your income equals your expenditures. So, you know, on this side you have the income, and your income equals all the things that you expend in your society. So what do you expend? You have your consumption goods, uh, everything that's consumed, then you have your investment. And investment is all the things that firms invest in. And th there's only one thing that really consumers invest in. What is that? Their house. Okay? So that's considered part of investment. It's not considered consumption. All right? So consumption is your clothes, your food. And, and, and we assume everybody has uh, a, you know, a certain level of autonomous consumption. So, uh, because if you're not consuming anything, we'll assume you're dead, okay? <laughs> so at any given time, in the process of your life, you have to be consuming. Now, at different points in your life, you'll consume less, and at different types, times in your life, you'll consume more. So we have what we call the income uh, lifetime uh, you know, hypothesis. So when you were a little kid, we assume you had negative income, all right? Um, but you were consuming because your parents were supplying you with stuff, you know, or somebody was supplying you with stuff. And then, you know, at this point in your life, um, the fact that you're sitting in this uh, classroom, I'll assume you don't have a lot of income, okay? So, uh, uh, but you might be making some income, and then you might not be making any income. Again, you might be being supplied by somebody else, your income. But you're consuming, you know, and you're consuming education as well. So, so everybody has a certain level of consumption, okay? And so, you know, given a certain amount of the population. Now, of course, when your income goes up, you consume more of everything, okay? And when your income goes down, you consume less of everything. So, so it, it, there's some basic autonomous consumption, and then the rest is associated with income, all right? So that's the first component of that equation, is consumption. And then, what also makes up the income of a society is investment. And investment is, uh, again, what companies are investing into uh, the, the society. And we usually say investment is, uh, is dependent on what? What, what? what determines how much? If, if a, what does the government do to try to get companies to invest more? Tax breaks, okay? So taxes can be part of uh, that investment equation. And there's something else that's very important. Interest rates. Because a lot of times, if you're gonna open up a business, what are you gonna do? You're gonna probably go borrow some money, okay? So you go to the bank or, or to uh, an organization that gives small businesses loans, and you give them a pitch, and you say, I got this great idea, and I wanna start a business, but uh, and then you've got businesses that already exist. And businesses that already exist, they're going to expand their businesses if what? Uh, and, and we're hearing this a lot now, right, with all the, the, gov the party <coughs> conferences that are going on. You know, on Monday I was at the uh, Conservatives uh, Conference, and of course they were talking a lot about, uh, you know, George Osborne doing what? Giving business tax breaks, okay? So, um, so taxes and interest rates are very important components then of determining investment spending. Uh, and we're going to come back to that because we're going to be really looking at investment. Uh, and then we have government spending. And of course, where does government get their income to spend? From taxes. Okay. So, first of all, that should alert you that there's a relationship then between inv investment and, and government spending. And we can get what we sometimes call in economics crowding out effect. 
where if the government starts spending too much, okay, and they start, uh, and they might have to tax more to spend more, then that means that uh, investment who, that does not like to be taxed will go down. So your investment uh, expenditure goes down and your government expenditure goes up. And, and that's sometimes how government can crowd out investment. All right? So, but, but government spends, you know, and, and in any country that has a government, they spend. And that normally means they tax something, all right? They've got to get money from somewhere. Um, or they have rents, or as in the bottom billion, they might have aid that they use. But they got to get some money to spend. And then we have net exports. So the X is for exports, and the M is for imports. So exports minus imports, okay? So those components then make up income, income for the country, all right? So one of the things then is that we look at factors of production, all right? So when we talk about factors of production, we talk about mainly we're talking about labor, okay? And we'll talk about how we define labor uh, probably next time. And we also talk about capital. And capital, what we usually mean, and in the context of this discussion that we're going to be having uh, over the next day or so, we are going to be talking about uh, capital in the form of machinery and equipment. Okay? That's the kind of capital we're going to be talking about. But sometimes the word capital is also used to talk about uh, money, monetary capital as well. Okay? Um, so labor is an important factor of production. Capital, though, is the one that we're going to be focusing on when we talk about technology and growth. Uh, and, 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 you know, many economists now agree that how growth takes place in an economy is through technology shocks. Now, according to the standard Com douglas production function, and a production function is essentially the equation that says, how do you mix labor and how do you mix capital to get with technology? to get output, okay? So normally we consider technology that kind of residual. It's, it's the extra one because you can have the same tech capital, the same equipment, same machinery, and you can have the same labor force. But if you can create technological change, you can actually do more with those resources, okay? So you can actually increase your output by just changing technology, okay? So, you can also do that then through capital. So, capital is one of the factors of production. And capital is accumulated when your gross new investment exceeds the appreciation of your existing capital, all right? So when you start, when a company, so when we think about goods and we think about the capital that's out there, and we think about the fact that it starts to depreciate, so once you put a, a, a machine in place, right, it starts instantly depreciate. If you buy a car, by the way, as soon as you drive it off the, the, the uh, lot, it starts to depreciate in value. It starts to lose value. And that's exactly how machinery works and equipment. Okay, so it has the same principle. So it starts to depreciate. So we look then to see the accumulation then of really gross. So what do we mean is new, new investment versus uh, investments that have already been made and are depreciating. And when we see that going up, when we see that going up, then we see we uh, figure that the uh, supply is going up. And that is very, very important. Now, to be able to do that as a society, and, and we're gonna, I'm going to just say a couple more things and then I'll stop for today, um, we have to make sure then that we're saving. So societies save. They build up a surplus. So if we think about uh, Western civilization, for example, in the UK, we say that people in the 18th century, or, or they started to create a surplus in agriculture, okay? And they started to make more from their agriculture. And they made more than they needed to eat. So they started to sell it to other places. And then what were they able to do? They were able to take that surplus and start to create more capital, equipment, machinery, okay? And then they were able to put that, that equipment to work. And that's why at the turn of the 20th century, you had the Industrial Revolution, all right? 
which again was a big push <coughs> up for uh, the, the Western civilization and the British economy, giving them a big push because they were able then to have that change, a, a capital change and technological change that allowed them to produce more and more quickly. And this is why if you uh, read the chapter in Global sh uh, Shift, it talks about how there's kind of a peaks and, and drops that take place, you know, it's, it's very cyclical in terms of technology. And what many economists believe today is that growth and, and real in, in economies really takes place because of, of technology shocks, these, these big technology shocks. So are we in the midst of a technology shock right now? Yes, we are. Okay, we are in the digital uh, shop, all right? We, we've got the computers, the, the whole broadband, uh, the use of digitalization, communication technology that is really, again, allowing us to get a big growth. So if we look then to other countries, then we want to look towards those kinds of periods to see how does an economy then harness that, you know, technological change to get those those kind of big big pushes and how do those big pushes take place so I'm going to stop there for today um, and then I'll try to catch up next week now just to remind you next week the lectures on Monday okay so now we're from now on we have the lectures on Mondays and then uh, everything is going to be on a Monday and I really appreciate your patience by the way uh, putting up with me for the last few weeks and coming on a Wednesday so thank you